All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Eli Sagor, Extension Specialist here at the Cloquet Forestry Center, uh, and really happy to kick off our Spring 2022 Forest Resources Department Seminar Series. Uh, it's really fun for us up here in Cloquet uh, to host the first offering in this series. A lot of students going through University of Minnesota Forestry Program spend time up here. It's a memorable place. It's a special place. And we're happy to host uh, the first seminar in our series this spring up here. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm really happy to have Aaron Kenya here with me. I'll introduce Aaron in just a minute. We've got a couple of preliminaries to get through before we kind of get into the conversation. I want to start with a, a brief land acknowledgement. As a university, the University of Minnesota, we recognize that the land on which we live, learn, and work is the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous peoples. We must build on this acknowledgement and work to improve and strengthen our relations with the 11 sovereign tribal nations of Minnesota. At the university, we're committed to the hard work of rebuilding trust and forming mutually beneficial partnerships, research and policies and practices that respect tribal traditions, languages and systems of governance. University leaders are taking action such as offering free or reduced tuition to enrolled band members on all five of our campuses. And we look forward to future actions we can take that can address our past and work toward a shared successful future. Those words are slightly modified from our president, Joan Gable. Uh, I know we're pleased here to see her commitment to uh, relations with our tribal community members. Um, and I thought it was fitting to start with that. As I said, uh, we are kicking off our uh, spring seminar series uh, for the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota down in St. Paul. Most of the time, not all the time, uh, most of the time the speakers in this series are academics, but our uh, seminar committee has uh, talked from time to time about the value of mixing things up. We've had speakers uh, now and then from uh, out in the real world as we uh, might think. And today, that's the situation with Aaron Kenya here. We're at an interesting time right now. Uh, fire has been in the news an awful lot. Huge destructive wildfires have really captured national attention in recent years from around the country, especially out west. There's a great interest in fire and what we might call good fire. There's an increasing understanding and attention to fire ecology, fire management human dimensions of fire, risk management, how people perceive and understand the role of fire in our uh, ecological communities. There's a growing recognition of the value and importance of understanding traditional ecological knowledge and, and applying that in our work. That includes knowledge of fire effects, cultural connections to fire, practices and getting good fire back on the landscape and a whole lot more. So today we're gonna talk with someone for whom fire is uh, a really important part of his work. Uh, Aaron Kenya is the Kuishiri District Ranger on the Superior National Forest. He's based in Ely. Aaron, it's great to have you here in Cloquet. Yeah, thanks, Eli. Uh, we've joked a little bit about Eli and Ely, so I'll, <laughs> I'll try to keep it straight. Um, we really appreciate the invitation coming here today. Um, particularly appreciate your uh, cultural acknowledgement. Um, as a Forest Service employee, that's very high on our priority list and it is a treaty obligation that that we want to acknowledge um, and a lot of this work that we do on a daily basis has a direct impact on the cultural practices and rights to hunt fish and gather so um, i just want to relay that as well and, and share that with you um, how important that is great good glad to hear it uh, just a brief housekeeping notes uh, note, most of the next 45 minutes or hour will be a conversation between Aaron and me. We thought everyone had probably seen enough slides and this might be an interesting way to approach the topic. I encourage you if you're on Zoom to uh, add questions through the Zoom chat. Rebecca Montgomery, who's a member of our seminar committee, will be monitoring those questions and relaying them to us. Uh, there will be time, 10 or 15 minutes, maybe more at the end for your Q&A. So please post those questions anytime. If you're in a room, like those of you here in Cloquet or uh, down in Green Hall or elsewhere with a group, just get your questions to somebody, uh, maybe scratch them down on a piece of paper or get them to someone who's sitting at a computer uh, and we'll, we'll uh, be happy to hear from those uh, and address those questions in a bit. So Aaron, 
What the heck does a district ranger do? You're uh, on the Kawishiwi Ranger District, a place that many of us have visited. Why don't we start by telling us a little bit about what a district ranger does uh, and how did you get to where you are today? What's your um, journey been to get you to this point? Sure, that's a fantastic question and it's uh, an answer I'm still working on. So I've been the Kawishiwi District Ranger since May of 2020 and I arrived you know, right when uh, the COVID pandemic was getting underway, um, there's still people I haven't met in person or without masks. So um, <laughs> basically, um, I'm entrusted with that responsibility of, of managing the landscape um, on one of five districts of the Superior National Forest. The Kawishwe District, based out of Ely, is about 50% wilderness and 50% non-wilderness. Um, I came here, and this is where I say I'm still learning. So um, I'd spent the majority of my career, all of my career out West in places like the National Park Service at Bryce Canyon National Park was my first job. Then I went over to the Bureau of Land Management and I spent about 20 years as a law enforcement ranger in Utah, Wyoming, and then back to Utah um, prior to coming here to the Superior. So. Um, in that time, a lot of, you know, fire related experience, but more on the fire investigation, um, evacuations, helping out on the kind of the peripheries of fire, but um, a lot of big incidents during that time, really on that western landscape and, you know, our, our, my heartstrings brought me to the boundary waters. Um, we would come to the boundary waters quite often for canoe trips with the family and this job was posted and on a really on a lark, uh, one of those what ifs, how cool would that be moments, I put my name in the hat and lo and behold, I got a call and one thing led to another and here I am and, you know, every day is just really a fantastic day, a, a, just a wide variety of subject matters come across the desk and uh, interactions throughout the day and weeks and months and you know, every day is just a, it's really a, truly a joy to go to work um, in all that diversity we have. So what does a district ranger do? Are you setting, are you writing management plans at a high level for, for forest management in the district? Is it really focused on fire and risk mitigation? Is it community engagement? What, what, what do you do on a, on a daily or weekly basis? Uh, so no two days are alike. <laughs> um, if I'm writing things, I'm probably not delegating well enough. <laughs> and, um, you know, currently our, our overall forest plan is from 2004, so that's pretty solid. Uh, what we're working on is a lot of implementation plans. Mm -hmm. So a combination of implementing existing plans or um, Environmental Policy Act um, decisions, and then also looking towards the future of what those next decisions are. Um, a big part of the plan from 2004 is the wilderness management plan and just the daily interactions with um, maintaining those wilderness standards and making sure that we're abiding by the plan and various rules, regulation, and policies that, that we are entrusted to manage. Great. And Aaron, I know a big part of your work relates to fire. So in a little bit, we're going to talk about the Pagami Creek fire specifically. That's part of the subject of our conversation. But as, as we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of different ways to think about fire. There are people who really feel that we need a lot more fire on the landscape. There are a lot of people really concerned that we have too much or we're at too high a risk of fire uh, on the landscape. Um, there are people motivated by and learning about and, and focusing on ecological benefits. We hear about forest health and and the role, the important role of disturbance. Hey, maybe fire helps to control tick populations. Maybe it helps to control diplodia. Maybe these things are, you know, we, we hear these things from time to time. So you spend a lot of your time. I know you're familiar with academic research and, and, and reading papers and reading reports as they come, come across your desk. You also spend a lot of time engaging with the community. And, and when you, let's talk about the community. When you hear about the community, when they come to you, specifically around fire what what are they what what's what's concerning them what are, what are the how do they think about fire yeah so that that answer really runs the gamut of the entire spectrum mm -hmm. there are those people that 
you know, feel that there should be no human uh, intervention when it comes to fire. Let, let fire return to its natural cycle, um, return to the landscape um, as it chooses. And then on the other end of the spectrum is let's manage every fire. Um, you know, let's not um, even light fires through like prescribed fire. Um, so there's, there's definitely that wide range. And then there's also a, a climate range, right? So last summer was a drought year, a lot of fire on the landscape. It was on the top of a lot of people's mind, the smoke every day in their view shed, um, if not in their house. And then, so last year fire dominated the conversation, but then other times, like say two years ago, a wet year, not a lot of smoke, not a lot of fire. People kind of stop thinking about it in a way. And, um, and then so it doesn't, it's, it doesn't even take a huge part of the conversation. So, so there's both a, a dynamic within society of, of that judgment base of what fire is good or bad. Um, and then there's also the where are we at in the in the climate cycle? Is it a, a hot, dry year, or is it a wet, cold year? Um, that also changes that that outcome. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit about the Pagami Creek fire. Uh, happened about ten years ago, a little more than ten years ago. Uh, why don't you tell us the story? Some of us, many of us, have been around for a while and remember it, uh, but um but not everybody so what what was that fire all about why is it uh why is it an event that sticks out so prominently in the minds of uh, so many in the community sure so you know when i did get that job offer and, and was working my way towards minnesota i was vaguely aware of pagami um it seems like every community has their own version of pagami and so as i was coming out here i spoke to the ranger before me uh, Gus Smith, who's a fire ecologist, had his PhD in fire, just really a solid guy, very knowledgeable. And through conversations with him, the I'll call it the shadow of Pagami really entered my uh, radar. And so I did a lot more research and my very first week, so I showed up Memorial Day, the Friday of that Memorial Day week, my fire crew was very grateful to them. They took me on a canoe trip out Lake One, Lake Two, out to the uh, Pagami Scar on the landscape. And we had some just fantastic conversations about what Pagami meant. And um, really, they explained to me where they're coming from, what happened, what those events were, what it means to the community. And so even though I wasn't here at that time, that knowledge doesn't just go away, it transfers from the community to the ranger and the next ranger. And we learn from those, those events. Um, so Pagami back in uh, 2011, it started from a lightning strike in August. And the decision at the time was to uh, manage the fire um, on the landscape. A real goal of the forest plan is to return fire to the landscape. And that was an opportunity that year had started out on the wet side and throughout the summer, um, it was it was fairly wet. Some of the fires that did start naturally extinguished. And so um, when the Pagami Creek fire started, the goal was to um, allow that fire to kind of grow on the landscape in a you know managed, monitored way. And it was in the wilderness. That's important. That's an important part of the story, right? It is for sure in the in the Boundary Waters canoe area wilderness. And I wasn't there at the time. I don't want to, you know, Monday morning quarterback any decisions that were made then. Um, you know, knowing from where I'm sitting now, those are extremely difficult decisions, and they're definitely not decisions made lightly. So um, the fire did grow onto the landscape. And one of the stories I hear quite often is the weather reports. So when you're managing a fire like this, the, the first thing you're looking at is, well, what's the weather going to do? And of course, like we're hard pressed to say what the weather's going to do tomorrow, <laughs> let alone a week from now or a month from now. And so you make the best decision with the best information. The, as I said, the summer had started out rather wet and then it kind of stopped being wet. And so, um, so as the fire progressed, the, 
the landscape became drier and the, the fire grew until um, one fairly major wind event early in September when the, the fire made really a rather unprecedented run in kind of that modern knowledge and not really within kind of that decision space that you're normally used to making decisions. So this tremendous run of about 16 miles, um, eventually at the end of the event, um, you know, consuming about almost 100,000 acres, just shy of 100,000 acres. So that was over a very short period of time. I don't think that that whole run wasn't in a single day, but there was one day, I, I remember that uh, just from, you know, being around and, and you know, it, it seemed like we went from nothing, then it started to grow a little bit and then bam, and it was really an explosive single day run that, um, as you say, shocked a lot of people, was outside of the kind of parameters of that planning. And it created some real, uh, some real danger for some people out in the wilderness. It's not easy to communicate out there. Can you talk a little bit more? So, so there's the, I, I'm sure during that run, and I remember this, there, there's concern about, is this thing ever gonna stop? Is it gonna keep running forever, uh, impacting resorts and, and cabin owners and recreationists and whomever on the outside, you know, on the other side of the boundary waters is gonna cross the Canadian border. Where's it gonna go? Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the and I, again, I, I know you weren't here at the moment that it was happening, but in the stories that you've heard, how, how were people feeling as this was happening? What was the, what was the sort of the mood as, as, as the fire was making that run? And then kind of what, what happened next? Sure. So when we talk about unprecedented, one really important on the scientific end of it, um, to get a little technical, they call it the Haynes index, and that's how much air moves vertically, essentially. Um, the weather forecast was basically, the Haynes index is one is low, six is the high end. Um, the discussion was, from what I've heard, is if there was a 10, this would be 10, which is yeah. outer space. And there's actually good research out there that shows that that smoke column ended up in Germany and in Europe um, before it finally came back. Um, so you could imagine with that much lift, it's described as a chimney, and that much forest, 16 mile run, how much smoke and how that looks. It was definitely making its own weather as it, as it had that event, um, weather dominated fire. And so of course, from Ely, from in the wilderness and from right in that immediate area, I mean, this is a tremendous force of nature, like off the spectrum of any of our lived experiences of what that would be like. Um, we saw a little bit of that on the Greenwood. We had one day like that on the Greenwood and I was right underneath it and translating that to Pagami, which would be a much uh, more intense experience. So, so Greenwood being the big fire last, just last summer. In 2021, part, yeah, yeah. Different part of the forest. So that day is definitely etched into the memory of everybody that was present for that or involved in it. And um, so that's why I say the shadow of Pagami, here I am 10 years later starting, and that's the first conversations I'm having. That's the first thing my fire crew wants to show me. Um, and it's hard to have a conversation around fire in particularly the Ely area, but probably Superior without the Pagami fire being it brought into that conversation. It's still, it's still very um, raw for people. I would say it's still very emotional for people. Um, you and I have spoken earlier about it being like an open wound that when people see fire, they see a smoke column, they immediately go back to that experience. And that's the first thing they think about. And definitely us as decision makers, well, now that's within our, what we call our slide deck, right? Mm -hmm. Our experiences. So now that's within the, the, um, the, the scale of possibilities. And so it definitely influences a lot of 
uh, decisions to this day. Yeah, and there, you know, of course, a wilderness area has a very low population density. There are a few people out there, more than a few. I know there's a large number of users going through the boundary waters relative to other wilderness areas. Uh, and remarkably, despite that run and almost 100,000 acres consumed, no loss of life, but there were some close calls and some pretty harrowing experiences as part of that, that, um, that I'm, I'm sure color the community's memory as well. Yeah, and, and to that note, um, that's one of the major lessons we learned. Um, so that was over Labor Day weekend when it made that run, one of the busiest weekends. And so um, it's not wrong or inaccurate to say that the Kushwe district is the busiest district. Um, the Boundary Waters is, is described as the busiest wilderness. Memorial Day weekend is probably the busiest weekend. Labor Day. Oh, I'm sorry, Labor Day. Yep. Thank you. And um, in Lake One, uh, the entry point <laughs> is the busiest. Yeah. So you're looking at the busiest of the busiest for this fire to occur. Um, and there is that responsibility to um, evacuate and move people out. But within that lived experience of prior knowledge, um, there was always kind of time. There, there, yeah. there wasn't that experience of how quick fire can move. And it takes a lot of time to get people um, out into the wilderness to move people out of the wilderness. Yeah. And so that's definitely one of the lessons we've learned is, is one, how big of an area to protect during a fire, and two, how long, how far ahead you need to make that decision um, in order to get people there and then get people out of harm's way. Which is a hard decision to make on a holiday weekend uh, to have someone paddle up to your site and say, you got to go, well, it's still miles away. What do you mean? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so there have been a lot of fires, a uh, number of fires, uh, wildfires in recent years uh, in your district and, and elsewhere on the forest. So you were just talking about, you know, changing that uh, decision, the timing of those evacuation decisions and some other things. So tell us a bit about the lessons that have been learned from Pagami Creek. I'm sure there are many, some relating to just what you were talking about, others related to maybe proactive steps or other ways to manage fire, although options are limited in a wilderness. But tell us about some of those uh, lessons and, and how the Pagami Creek experience has informed um, our response to fires now and our the ways that we manage fire now. Sure. So I would say there's there's three major lessons coming out of Pagami for us. Um, the first one is again making that buffer large and making it in a timely way. The other one is the you know really that transparency of um, providing the information, letting letting everybody know why we're making this decision, what information is feeding into that decision. Um, and then the third one, a little bit tied in with that first one is that evacuation planning. Um, so the, the forest service has a certain role, particularly if it's on the forest, but then in the communities outside the forest, um, those decisions are largely made by the county emergency managers or the city. And so making sure that our flow of communication is tied in closely with um, what their expectations are and what their plans are. So, so the three things is, you know, protecting the public, um, the transparency and communication, and then the evacuation planning. And you mentioned that half your district is in the wilderness. Many of those wilderness visitors are people coming a long way. So well outside the community, not plugged into those communication channels. Some of them, no doubt, would be getting information from outfitters or guides or, or others in the community as they pass through, but they're going to have a range of experiences and knowledge levels about how to manage their own risk and, and so on. So there's the wilderness, there's the sort of preparation and, and response planning in the wilderness. How, does, how is that similar or different from what you're doing on the other half of your district, which is private landowners, cabin owners, businesses? loggers working in the woods, recreationists outside the wilderness, and so on. Um, uh, how has Pagami Creek informed uh, the response outside the wilderness? Yeah, so 
I'll give you an example. Last uh, summer of 2020, we had a couple fires and the, the fire alarm would go off. All the fire trucks would leave the hall. They'd, they'd head out, respond. And the rest of us are kind of sitting at the district office, you know, waiting for more information or starting to gather teams to, to prepare a bigger response. And I'd go to my front desk and my front desk would just be, the phones would be ringing off the hook. And it's anybody from a outfitter that has a client out there to a cabin owner on burnt side lake and um the mayor calling and and it was like wow like we need to how do we use modern technology to fix this problem and so one thing we really did in 2021 was use social media mm -hmm. because there's so many interested parties it's in order to reach them all the quickest way really is with social media that if we could fairly quickly send out a message saying, we know we have a fire, this is where it's at, we're responding to it, we'll have more information soon, um, can really um, expedite that chain. The other thing is our um, media outlets. So there's a lot of news outlets that we're calling. I think one day on the Greenstone or the Greenwood fire, we had 35 media interviews in one day. And thankfully we have a team that comes in and they yeah. have extra resources, but that's the level of information that's necessary to spread the word far and, and wide. And then once people, um, you know, follow our social media, then they can get that information much quicker. Yeah. And a thing that, that, and, and I fire is not a, a major focus for me, but one thing that, uh, that I really noticed in the response to the Greenwood fire was, uh, and other fires out west that are in last summer and in recent years is these stand up, you know, outside uh, media briefings where you have someone standing in front of a sheet of plywood with a couple of maps stapled to it. Uh, a lot of those I I got uh, I I saw a lot of those through Facebook. I'm sure that there were other ways to see those, but I found I'm not a big Facebook user, but I found that Facebook was just like you're saying. You guys were using social media, so embracing some of those ways of getting the word out and. They weren't all high tech, but those were very effective. You had someone really pointing to a map, talking about what's going on, what are the concerns. Um, and I, I think both conveying information and also conveying a sense that we're on this. This is how we're thinking about it. This is not just what we need you to do, but this is why. And um, it, it's I, I'm sure people were not always happy with what they were hearing. Uh, they're, they're never going to be, especially when you have people traveling a long way, going to a place that they really value and want to spend time and suddenly they have to leave or the skies are full of smoke. And why is this happening? I don't I don't get it. Well, but it, it seemed like you really had embraced some of those some good methods to get the word out. And I think the the other part of your question is, how do we interact with those areas outside the wilderness? And so that's what we're doing this time of year when we have three feet of snow on the ground is we're meeting with our agency partners. So our elected officials, our local fire departments, uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And we're having a lot of conversations this time of year about the agreements we have. Um, how do we order resources? Like how can we you know, use a local um, fire truck and then how will you get paid and how will you get plugged into the system so that you're safe um, what our plans are for prescribed fire like basically who's new <laughs> what's your contact information and we're updating all of those plans uh, last year um, so incident management teams are huge hugely critical for success nowadays on these large incidents one thing that we did on the very first fire, the Delta Lake fire, we had a team come in. And lucky for us, the folks that were on that team had also been on the Pagami Creek fire. Huh. And so the very first meeting we had, they had brought out, here was the evacuation plan from the Pagami Creek huh. fire. And they had like the original document for it. And they said, we'd like to convene a meeting um, with the two counties, in the city of Ely and make sure that all of our evacuation plans are that we're all on the same page if we have to go there. Um, so that was a lesson learned and here's the original documents come out and make sure like early in the incident that everybody's on the same page. So those are huge um, for the success that 
you don't want to have to push that button, but if you have to push that button, that everybody's knows what's going to happen when we get to that point, if we get to that point. And, and one of the, so you and I have been in touch a lot uh, around a, a series of events related to fire in the Ely area this spring. And I, I've been impressed at the um, amount of energy that you and your team and others in the community are putting into that work now when we're outside of the fire season. And it, it seems to me that a big part of that is building trust, building relationships. You're in a small town. I've moved to small towns. Uh, new people in small towns are not always immediately seen as uh, members of the community. You got to um, pay your dues, spend your time building relationships to build that sense of trust. And obviously you're working for a large agency. There are many others in the community who have strong ties and so forth. But I'm, I'm curious about just that, that aspect of it, um, of, of, you know, part of what you're doing is disseminating information. But a bigger part of it is, is, I think, is building trust and building relationships. So how do you do that as a, I mean, it's crucial when we're, when we're in the middle of an incident that when you or a member of your team issues an evacuation order or, or shares information that people not only hear it, but, but see it as valid and, um, and respond in appropriate ways. And there's never going to be 100% compliance. You know, you hear about hurricanes blowing in from wherever, and there are always people who are going to ride it out. <laughs> and I, I know the same is true of fires and other kinds of natural dis uh, uh, disturbances and, and disasters. So uh, how, do you, um, how do you think about that? Is, uh, you know, now, I mean, is it really about building trust? Is, it, is trust really not the thing? Is it something else? What are you really trying to do, uh, you know, during this period now when there's no incident? but when we are laying the groundwork for a successful response in the future. So it's definitely about trust. It's, it's trust for the community uh, with the agency that they know the information that, that we have to then make the decisions. The more you practice that conversation, the more knowledgeable the community is and understands some of the nuances. Like we had said, there's a spectrum of fire from you know, a single tree to a Pagami style event, and then different intensities of fire. And that to me is where a lot of that community development education is, is talking about fire. Not every fire is the Pagami fire. Um, some fires are small and extinguish themselves. And so there's that range. And so it's really being able to communicate what that range is and then how we respond to know that we're trying our best. Some fires, like the greenwood, no matter what we throw at it, it's going to get, it's going to grow. But we're throwing everything we have at it. Um, other fires, even like the Pagami, it's not an intended outcome for that to get that big, and that does happen. And that's that's a reality of this business, and that's that's what's really tough. Um, whether it's a prescribed fire. There's a very small percentage that uh, will escape and will get bigger. Um, but yet, if we're not working on those fires, if we're not working with fire on the landscape, then the fuels are going to really grow um, astronomically. And then events like Pagami are more likely to occur. So somewhere in there, we're, we're intervening when we have opportunities to reduce that fuel load. Yeah, so let's let's go there. I, I think I think that's a really interesting, and in some ways, that's really the crux of it. Because in a lot of, whether we're talking about the fires out west or uh, right in our own backyard, a big factor that has increased the intensity of those fires and the risk associated with those fires is the amount of fire suppression and the duration of that. It's been a century or or uh, more than a century, depending on where you are, of putting out fires as quickly as we possibly can to avoid damage to property and timber and, and to avoid risk and loss of human life. We've had um, you know, some uh, just devastating fires right, right here uh, you know, early in the last century mm -hmm. and so on. So for a lot of people, they associate th their experience with fire, um, you know, uh, the, the, the really intense traumatic sort of experience that they have with fire is 
uh, is that it's to be avoided, is that it's a, it's a source of danger. Um, people die, uh, there are catastrophic losses of forests that we love, of, of property, of homes, of people. But you know, uh, and, and a number of people in our department here at the Cloquet Forestry Center and elsewhere are, are, are working hard to, um, to, to understand the, the roles of fire and to communicate about the benefits of fire. A big part of the reason that these fires are so intense is that we've suppressed and almost eliminated fire and that has allowed fuels to build up. The situation around the Greenwood Lake fire last year, you mentioned that no matter what we throw at that, that's going because, and a big part of that was all the dead balsam fir that was across, spread across the landscape because of a spruce budworm outbreak. And, and you had just a tremendous uh, level of fuel loading and, 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 and so on. And so we know that we need to avoid situations where we have these tremendous buildups that just lead to a, you know, a tinderbox that goes up. But, and a, and a really important part you know, we know that our forests depend on fire. Our for, most of Minnesota's forests are fire dependent. They're ecological communities that wouldn't be the way they are without fire. We wouldn't have the big red pine, the big jack pine and, and white pine across Northern Minnesota that people associate with the wilderness. It wouldn't be what Northern Minnesota is today without fire, but we fear fire. So how, you know, when we think about good fire, when we think about whether it's for cultural reasons, as we're um, increasingly learning from our, our tribal neighbors and community members, whether it's grounded in an ecological understanding of the forces, you know, driving nutrient dynamics and and you know species uh, uh, movement and so forth, um, we know that we need fire on the landscape. We know that historically most fire wasn't these catastrophic crown fires that kill everything in their path. So how do you think about reestablishing good fire across the landscape, prescribed burns, managing fuel loading so that when events like Pagami Creek happen, they don't, they're not as traumatic or as destructive. Um, how, do you, how do you work that into community engagement efforts in ways that um, can help people understand the positive roles of fire and really the need for fire? Um, Although, you know, even when most of their experience with fire is is maybe traumatic, is, is very difficult to, to deal with. Sure. Um, I've been reading this book on beavers yeah. and um, I, I come across this phrase, uh, cultural capacity or um, cultural carrying capacity. So there's there's that landscape carrying capacity for how many beavers you can have in a watershed. But there's also a cultural carrying capacity, like you know, roads and damage to property, et cetera. And it really relates well to fire. Like we know historically what the landscape carrying capacity of fire was, like a 60 to 80 year return interval, kind of on average, depending on where you're at. Um, but now what we're talking about is what's that cultural carrying capacity of fire? And historically, the landscape that we inherited was probably one of the best managed landscapes imaginable. Um, really like wildlife, blueberries, wild rice. It, it was a tremendous landscape and to acknowledge that, that traditional knowledge and how successful application of fire to the landscape was for this landscape. We inherited that landscape and look back and say, wow, these white pines, red pines, fish, game, blueberries, it's tremendous. So at a time, the cultural capacity of fire was really high and the outcome was really good. Now there is um, a, a reduced acceptance of fire because we have so much at stake. Um, our homes are you know, on a foundation, on the landscape, um, our power lines, our propane tanks. And it's really, um, we're immobile when it comes to fire on that landscape in a lot of ways. So we have to be proactive, kind of working out from our properties and then working at that interface between that private land and public lands. Um, and with that generally comes a higher acceptance, a higher cultural carrying capacity. Um, I think, 
you know, there is a segment of the population too that sees that returning fire back to the landscape will have tremendous benefits and reduce that risk. So there the cultural capacity increases. Um, I would say in, in my time here, when we do suppress a wildfire in the wilderness in particular, social media lights up, my phone lights up, we get letters like, why are you suppressing this fire? And oftentimes I've heard that more, that question of why are you suppressing this? Hmm. And less, like I haven't had an opportunity with COVID and the fire severity we had to um, the appropriate response for a fire or a managed type fire. Um, so I haven't experienced that, but in conversations in the community, you can see how people are accepting that prescribed fire on the land, managing fire on the land, when it's lower intensities, we have resources available, there, there's probably a greater acceptance. And I'll give an example that a lot of people saw during the Greenwood fire. So when the Greenwood fire moved to the north, there was a, a timber stand, a red pine, that had a first entry thinning, commercial thinning, and, and then a first entry prescribed fire hmm. that went through it. Yeah. When the Greenwood fire approached that, that was the first area of the Greenwood fire that we had a control line, hmm. that we contained the fire, so what we call turning it black. And that was the first place. Yeah. And we've done a lot of uh, tours and field trips to there to show people firsthand what that management looks like, what returning fire at a low intensity to the landscape looks like. And they're amazed. And it, when you see that, it clicks. Like yeah. that's why we need fire back on the landscape because it does protect us. So Aaron, I mentioned before, you and I have been in touch a lot in recent weeks about planning some events up in the Ely area. And one of the things that you have um, really made it clear as a priority for you is bringing in voices from our tribal communities. We've talked about one of these events, having a panel uh, where we're gonna feature a video. I'm sure some of our um, uh, viewers and listeners have seen the Ashkigan video that tells a story of American Indian use of fire with uh, stories from some people right, right here in our community in Cloquet and, and the Fond du Lac Reservation. Why do you see those voices as especially important? You, you've really been pushing our group to elevate those voices, bring those people to the table. Why is that? First of all, it is, it is our obligation um, for the treaty rights to manage a landscape that provides those opportunities to hunt, fish, and gather. Um, as I said earlier, this landscape is evolved with fire, and through the use of good fire, it's provided for centuries that ability to, you know, foster a whole society, um, good food, plenty of nutrition, medicine, and through fire, we can honor that treaty obligation, I believe, is, is one of the, the big tools. Um, in wilderness, fire is, is one of the only tools to reduce um, that that high fuel load and you know get back to uh, an equilibrium on the landscape so knowing knowing what that traditional knowledge is when the best time to burn like if we use blueberries in a, as an example when's the best time to burn to get the most production out of blueberries or to you know save the rhizomes and the blueberries and you know, um, have the right intensity, what's the right timing. And in the knowledge I have in some of the burn plans we write, to include that information in helps have the best outcome. So it really, it really does require a, a good conversation about, hey, can you think about this during your burn plan? And when you implement your burn plan, as opposed to we're just going to get acres accomplished. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the outcome of that work? Great. Well, Aaron, thank you. I, I think we're going to transition now to questions from the audience. Uh, Rebecca, I know that you have been monitoring the chat. Um, I don't know if there are questions here. If someone wants to bring them, you can bring them forward to me. That'd be fine. Uh, but Rebecca, I think I'm going to turn the screen to you to um, uh, bring those questions up. 
Uh, it sounds like Ben is going to do that. All right, go ahead, Ben. Anyway, um, we have two questions from the chat. Um, the first one uh, is, uh, can Aaron comment on if the incident command teams had enough real-time aerial thermal imagery to see where the fire fronts were moving for the Greenwood Lake fire? Yeah, that's that's a challenge during fire season, especially uh, what we say back east here, because generally we fly an aircraft over. So we were able to use some satellite technology. I was out there that day. Um, and we had pretty real time knowledge as to where they were. A um, lot of good satellite technology these days. To grow on that a little bit too, during the Canadian fires, which were right close to the US border, it, it was a lot of that um, infrared monitoring or satellites or aircraft that were able to determine exactly where those fires in Canada were. Uh, Canada at the time was pretty overwhelmed uh, resource wise. And so we were, we were wanting to know good information as to where the, those fires were. And we used a lot of that, that technology to determine that. Great. Uh, our second question is um, from the air, it looks like uh, the area is regenerating to a lot of jack pine. Uh, can you comment on what's been observed on the ground for regeneration there? Um, and the commenter is thinking about the future of the forest and moose habitat uh, longevity specifically. Yeah, so we really won't know the answer to that for probably a couple years. Um, even from our silver cultural shop, uh, they look at five years to certify a stand. So now, are you looking at Greenwood or Pagami? Oh, um, I'm thinking more about Greenwood, sorry. Um, if you're talking Pagami, yeah, there's mostly jack pine coming in in that area. Some of the places I've seen though, depending on the burn intensity, uh, there are some of the hardwoods and I think there's some fantastic research out there with, with moose habitat and how moose have utilized that. Um, I think we're probably over the next few years and decades probably gonna have more fires out in that area. We saw that those fires that had happened in the Pagami Scar were fairly receptive to growth. Um, and that jack pine can carry fire well. It's tall enough now that um, it has potential for growth. So I think we'll have to see in the coming years, you know, where we end up. Yeah, yeah it's nice out there. It is, it's very lush with jack pine and aspen and other things, as you say, other hardwoods too. We have a question here from Cloquet. Why don't we do this one next? How does your LEO background and interagency history with the National Park Service and the Bureau of Land Management shape how you function as a Forest Service District Ranger? Do you think you operate differently than other rangers that have worked only with the Forest Service? It's huh. a great question. <laughs> I, I ponder that often. It's a non-traditional route to be a district ranger. Yeah. Um, I would say it heavily influences the direction I go with community outreach. So particularly as a Bureau of Land Management Ranger, um, when I was in Salt Lake, there was two of us for 3 million acres. When I was in Wyoming, <laughs> there was me and 4 million acres. And you're, you're alone out there. So if you don't have strong connections with the sheriff's offices, the highway patrol, the game wardens, you're out there on your own. And um, it's kind of the same with fire, that you don't want to be out there on your own with a large incident. You want everybody being on the same page. You want those relationships tight. Um, and I worked in Southern Utah. Southern Utah is very controversial uh, in a lot of respects. Oftentimes, having a cup of coffee or sitting down, having lunch with somebody and, and just developing that relationship, getting to know each other goes a long way when um, something goes goes bad or it's a difficult day. And I would say we did that, I'll give an example. Um, this summer, we had a fire north of Lake Vermilion. Um, we had developed that relationship with St. Louis County Emergency Manager. Literally in a text message, I sent him a photo of where the fire is and where the properties were, um, some of the resorts and cabins. And um, I said, Dewey, this one has potential. The weather's lining up. Can you come up here? 
And in the hour and a half it took him to drive up, he had worked with his, um, his staff. They developed evacuation maps. They had, had everything in place in really probably an hour, hour and a half. Mm. Everything was ready to go based on one text message in that relationship we had built. Mm. Ben, back to you. Okay, our next question um, from the chat is, uh, how have fires like uh, the Pagami fire changed timber management and the role of harvesting along with prescribed fire use? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I kind of have two years of experience, but uh, a 2004 management plan. And on, on my district in particular, I would say the way it's changed it over the years is we're a little bit more strategic and where we do some timber sales. And then also, I think we're working towards the trajectory of being more comfortable with uh, introducing fire into timber stands. Uh, there's definitely some economic disadvantages of putting too much fire in a timber stand. But um, so the way we're, we're resolving that particularly on the Kwishwe district is integrated planning. So when we meet and we're talking about a project area, we make sure we have everybody in the room. So our silviculturalists, our timber shop, our fuels and fire folks, wildlife, recreation, they're all in the room. They're all looking at the same maps. They're all talking about the same project and they're talking about outcomes of the project. So that gets us a really good uh, silviculturalist, um, writes the prescription gets us our final prescription. And that goes into, you know, both the implementation of the um, harvest and the implementation of a prescribed fire so that we know what the concerns are and we can best mitigate those concerns. The other part of that is strategically on the landscape. So focusing on those areas where essentially we can build landscape level control lines. So we have a couple on the Kushwe district. One is um, what we call the North Arm of Burntside Lake. A lot of properties there. Some people might be familiar with the YMCA camps. And so to um, do some fuel reduction work up there, not much of that is, is harvest, but to do some fuel reduction work. So if something comes out of the wilderness, we can lower that intensity before it gets to those properties. Another one, um, some people saw what's called the Kangas uh, prescribed burn last year. And so that's along Birch Lake. So uh, we used really strategic timber sales, plus prescribed burn adjacent to the lake to create this really nice buffer on the landscape that if a fire comes, um, not really outside the wilderness, but if it comes from the, the east, we have a control opportunity. And if it comes from the west, we have a, this landscape scale um, control or reduction. I should say we, it would reduce fire intensity, not eliminate it, but it gives us an opportunity for firefighters to find success. Do you find that the community is more receptive to forest management activities? Is, I don't know how much resistance there is, but when you can talk about that integrated kind of package of forest management, really timber harvesting, and in, in this case, with fire reduction risk, you know, so producing wood products, but also um, reducing that risk, does that combination make the community more open to those activities or is that not much of an issue? Is, is the community pretty receptive to that uh, either way? I think it varies. Uh, it really varies into what type of property is. Um, and I would even say the occupation of the person living there. So um, some people that are in the forest products industry, we have a lot of miners and uh, uh, loggers in the Ely area they're calling us like, hey, when can we get this cut and let's get some fire out there. Uh, we have some other folks that come up, um, you know, from the cities and they, they like that privacy. So even like some balsam fur around their property, which protects their view shed from their neighbors or from the road, there's, there's a reduced desire to, to do some control work there. Um, so it, it definitely varies, yeah. but um, generally I would say, so last year, the, our, our FireWise community uh, went from like 15 property assessments a year to like over 100 property assessments to what they could do to FireWise. And um, I'm paraphrasing some of the conversations I had with them, but the 
the interest in in doing work around properties went up tremendously Great. this past year. Good. Ben, back to you. Uh, we have a, a couple questions actually that are similar um, to that topic. Um, I've kind of combined them here into uh, um, what services uh, to contact or advice um, uh, can we give to uh, private home or cabin owners uh, to prepare and um, potentially reduce risk for their, their homes, uh, their neighborhoods, um, their property uh, to, to prepare for um, any potential wildfire scenarios? Sure, great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, probably one of the better ones, and I'll just off the top of my head, we might have to fact check this one, but uh, minnesotafireadaptedcommunities.org is probably one of the, the best spots. Um, so that shows what the fire risk can be near a house. And it can also link people to the FireWise programs where an assessment can come to their property. And then there's also various grants and programs out there, either the NRCS, the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, or FireWise. The Forest Service has uh, adjacent land grants or adjacent landowners grants that we're working on, particularly uh, we have about three of them up in the Ely area that we work through um, the counties to then uh, put together those grants and then really focus those efforts on specific communities. A lot of uh, contractors then get involved and uh, come out, do pile burning or, or pile building, pile burning, wood chipping, and just kind of clearing out that area immediately adjacent to the house. So those are probably the best resources on private land. And then those organizations are working quite closely with the land managers like the Forest Service to to make sure that we're being strategic and not just, you know, an acre here and an acre there, um, that it's really on the landscape that will that will help the most. Um, okay, uh, we've got um, many more questions, so it sounds like we may not uh, be able to get to all of them. Um, I'll uh, uh, read off one that Rebecca took from um, from Green Hall. Um, which is we hear about challenges at the national level regarding um, forest service funding and firefighting. And uh, this person is curious to hear perspectives about um, what that looks like from the, the sort of district uh, forest view. Well, big changes, big changes in that department. So a couple of years ago, there were um, changes as far as how firefighting was funded. Um, and then the most recent big change was in the infrastructure bill. And the infrastructure bill uh, dedicated quite a bit of funding for forest restoration work um, in that prevention ahead of the fire. So that work and on the drive down here, I was listening into a meeting on the forest for a tremendous number of new positions to the forest. So one, filling all of the vacancies within the agency, and then two, um, adding capacity to those things such as uh, our silviculture program, our forestry program, our firefighters. Um, you know, it's really disturbing. I, my teenage daughter last year uh, had a summer gig cleaning cabins for a resort, and she was making more um, than my firefighters that were out working on the Greenwood fire. And um, I did relay that to one of our congressional representatives that, you know, this is when we're trying to retain employees, we're putting them on the front line that, that um, having a full-time job or a, a more permanent job and then being paid for that job is, is a tremendous lift to um, the amount of training and knowledge um, to fight a fire and do it safely and do it well. Um, we put a lot into those employees. And so to be able to retain them and uh, support them is, is huge. And I can't speak enough of how important that is. So big changes, but I think those changes in the last few years have been really towards the positive. Well, we're about out our time. Uh, ben, thank you for fielding questions. Thanks to everyone for asking questions. Uh, I know we've got more and I, I'm afraid we just, we, we can't get to all of them, but I really appreciate your being here, Aaron, and helping us to kick off this series. Um, 
I'll remind folks uh, the next seminar in our spring series is going to feature Krauss and Kyle Gill. Kyle is our forest manager here. Krauss works at Michigan Tech University. That uh, conversation is called Five Questions Between Two Foresters. Krauss and Kyle converse about queer life in the natural resources community. That'll be March 28th. Uh, and uh, we will have both in-person and online options to connect to that one. A month after that, we'll be back kind of talking about fire. Uh, we'll hear from Kurt Kipmuller, who's on the faculty here in the Department of Geography at the University of Minnesota. Kurt will be talking about interpreting the stories from the rings of trees, cultural fire use, and the shaping of Great Lakes pine forests. Again, that's April 25th. So uh, thank you, Aaron, again, for making the trip to join us here in Cloquet to kick off the Forest Resources Seminar Series. Thanks to all of you for coming, and I hope we'll see you again in about a month.